What shape do you most associate with a standard analog clock? Your reflex answer might be a circle, but a more natural answer is actually a torus. Surprised? Then stick around. I'll explain what I mean and pose a clock puzzle challenge problem that adopting this viewpoint might help you to solve. Some configurations of a clock, like the hour hand at 3 with the minute hand at 12, represent valid times of day. If the hands sweep around continuously at their usual steady rates, this configuration will actually happen every 12 hours, at precisely 3 o'clock. But other configurations are invalid, like the hour hand at 3 with the minute hand anywhere other than 12, since the hour hand moves slightly off the 3 as soon as the minute hand leaves the 12. Fine. Now take a valid configuration, but swap the positions of the hands. Is that new configuration also valid? Well, if the hands overlap, then yes, since swapping wouldn't change the reading on the clock. But if the hands don't overlap, you certainly won't get a valid time in general. Just look at 3 o'clock. Remember, swapping the hands here won't give you 12.15 or any other legitimate time for that matter. So are there any other solutions? And how would you find them? This is an old problem that can be tackled in lots of different ways. But there's a visual approach that I especially like because it illustrates how the quotienting concept that Ty Denae introduced last time can give you unexpected problem-solving power when applied to shapes. So without giving away the answer or even the whole method, I'm going to take a detour into quotient shapes to give you just enough ammunition to attack the problem this way if you choose to. Of course, you're free to tackle the problem however you like, and later in the episode, I'll circle back to refine the question and tell you how to submit answers. Before we get started, though, you might want to pause me and get some important background from two of Ty Denae's earlier episodes, her intro to quotienting and her episode about topology and open sets. So go check those out and then rendezvous back here with me to rock out with your clock out. Let me start by quite literally dissecting the clock, meaning let's detach the two hands and mount each one on its own clock face. Now orient those clock faces at 90 degrees to each other and connect them like this so that the entire minute hand gets dragged by the hour hand along a wider circle. If you play around with this contraption, you'll notice that no matter how you position the two hands, the tip of the minute hand always falls on the surface of this torus. That's why a torus is a natural backdrop for analyzing two-hand clocks, because each point on the torus corresponds to exactly one possible configuration of the two hands and vice versa. Okay. Now initialize the clock to midnight and let the hands run at their usual steady rates. As time passes, the tip of the minute hand traces out a helical curve that winds 12 times around the torus before closing on itself and starting over. Apparently, the points traced out by that curve should correspond to all the valid clock configurations that actually occur during each 12-hour cycle. Now, a helix wrapped around a torus isn't exactly the easiest thing to work with, but as it turns out, this coil can be reimagined as just a bunch of simple straight lines on a square. And the key to that simplification is the concept of quotient shapes, or to be more precise, quotient spaces. Here's the idea. If you had a square sheet of a stretchable material, like foam rubber, you could build a torus out of it in two stages. First, you could fold it and glue these two sides together to make a cylinder. And then you could fold the cylinder in the other direction and glue the open circular edges together to make a torus. But there's a way to achieve this same effect without folding or gluing anything, or even visually imagining any folding or gluing. Here's the alternative procedure. Step one, why don't we just declare each pair of points that are directly across from each other on opposite edges of the square to be equivalent? If you think about it, that's tantamount to defining an equivalence relation on the square that also treats all four corners as equivalent. That's got to be true by transitivity. And that also makes each interior point equivalent only to itself. Now step two, treat each equivalence class, or bucket, as if it were a single point. In other words, quotient out the square by this equivalence relation. Remember, treating equivalence classes themselves as your basic objects, rather than the things inside those classes, is essentially what quotienting is. To get a visual sense of what this is, it's like we've turned the square into a Pac-Man game, where hitting any wall brings you back in through the opposite wall without changing your overall heading. Now, my claim is that Pac-Manifying the square by quotienting out this particular equivalence relation 
gives you something topologically equivalent to the torus. In other words, the quotienting effectively gives you folding and gluing without any of the 3D visual overhead. Technically, to formally establish this correspondence, I'd still need to show two things. One, that the Pac-Man square equipped with its new concept of identical points inherits a notion of open sets or neighborhoods from the original square. And two, that there exists a one-to-one -one mapping between the Pac-Manified square and an actual torus that maps neighbors in one space to neighbors in the other space. Demonstrating all that rigorously would take us too far off track today, but both facts turn out to be true. And at least with the cylinder, you should be able to convince yourself that this all works out, and that a helical barber pole curve on the cylinder would in fact correspond to a line on a square that has Pac-Man edges at the left and right. Now this quotienting procedure turns out to be very general. Just change the equivalence relation, and you can build all sorts of funky shapes out of a square. For instance, say you equate opposite points on the left and right edges like before, but now equate all the points on the top edge just with one another. You get a cone. Or equate diagonally opposite points on just the top and bottom edges, and you get a Mobius strip. If you throw in diagonally opposite points on the left and right edges on top of that, you get a Klein bottle. This list goes on and on, and you can use base shapes other than a square. If you've never seen this before, I encourage you to play around with the options, because it's pretty fun. But let's get back to the clock puzzle. If you buy my arguments so far, then the points on the Pac-Manified square, just like points on the torus, should represent all possible configurations of the clock. And the winding helix, which captured just the valid configurations that actually occur during times of day, would correspond to a line that climbs up the square by repeatedly exiting through one side and re-entering on the opposite side. So, just call the bottom edge the minute hand axis and the left edge the hour hand axis, set a convenient scale of your choice for each axis, and you should be able to tackle the valid swaps problem with just some high school math and a little patience. I will leave you with one hint. Think about what geometric operation on the square swapping the clock hands would correspond to. I'll wrap up by posing the challenge formally. We want you to find all valid clock configurations for which swapping the hour and minute hands would also result in a valid configuration. Work only within a 12 hour period, say midnight to noon, not including noon, and report all the times in hour, minute, second format, including fractions of a second with no decimal approximations or rounding. For instance, one hour, five minutes, and 27 and 3 seconds after midnight. You need to report all and only the correct times in order to get credit. Email your solutions to pbsinfiniteseries at gmail.com with the subject line clock challenge within the next two weeks. We'll randomly select five winners from among the correct answers to receive a PBS t-shirt. In the meantime, good luck, get clocking, and I'll see you guys soon. Hey everyone, Ty Dene here, responding to comments from the episode How to Divide by Zero. Some of you, like Yoris and Time Master 2, asked about the remainders mod 5. Shouldn't the only remainders be 1 or 2 and never 3 or 4? To use their example, 14 is off by 4 because its remainder after dividing by 5 is 4. But you might also say it's off by 1 because 14 is 15, a multiple of 5, minus 1. Great question. So certainly it's true that 14 is 15 minus one, but we usually toss out that example because the remainder, negative one, is not a positive number. And this goes back to something called the division algorithm. Let me give you a somewhat silly, but hopefully illuminating example. If you have 14 books and you wanna share them with five friends evenly, each person will get two books and there will be four books left over. That's the remainder. In particular, it's impossible to give everyone three books and then take one away. You only had 14 to begin with. This might suggest that, at least in terms of division, it's helpful to think of 14 as 10 plus 4 rather than as 15 minus 1. And this is what the division algorithm does for us. It's a theorem that says that we can find unique integers q called the quotient and r called the remainder so that number one, r is bigger than or equal to zero but strictly less than five, and number two, so that 14 can be written as five times q plus r. And now it's clear why r, the remainder, must be four and q, the quotient, must be two, i.e. 14 is 10 plus four. 
By the way, the division algorithm can also work for things that aren't numbers, like polynomials. It's all a part of the abstract study of rings, ring theory. But that episode was really about group theory, which I agree with you, Austin, is very exciting. And I'm glad you didn't forget about category theory. You might like to know that quotienting or gluing things together has a very categorical description. In fact, there is a sense in which quotient sets are dual to the Cartesian product of sets. In what sense exactly? Maybe we'll talk about that another time. See you soon.